Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Gary. And I'm Sabrina. Before we get into this episode, we have a special announcement. In October, we will be officially launching our latest dinosaur book, 50 Dinosaur Tales. And if you're a Tyrannosaurus patron, we'll be sending you a signed physical copy of the book. So please update your addresses or join at the Tyrannosaurus level by August 21st. In our 243rd episode, we have a bunch of dinosaur news, including a new American hadrosaur and more opalized fossils from Australia. We also have an interview with Dr. Jen Bauer about all the ways people become paleontologists and potentially how you too could become a paleontologist, if that's something you're interested in. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Tuojangasaurus. But before we get into all that, we'd like to thank some of our patrons who help us keep the podcast going. And this week, we'd like to thank Kyle, Brendan Kavanaugh, the Tolbert family, Sean Tanagaki, Remy Rodriguez, Marcy, Rohan, Bradley, Bilal, Scully, Avery, Crispy, Joaquin, Jeb from Arkansas, Aiden James, Albertosaurus, and Alan. Yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciate your support, especially with SVP coming up and all of those exciting things. So if you want to join, and like we mentioned before, if you want a special signed copy of our upcoming book, then check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Jumping into the news, we'll kick it off with a new dinosaur like we like to when those are available. Which is often. <laughs> yes, fortunately. But this week we have what they are describing as an unusual shovel-built dinosaur from Texas. And it was written by Albert Prieto Marquez and others and published in the Journal of Systematic Paleontology. So their systematic paleontology section is really on point, as you'd <laughs> expect. <laughs> so this hadrosaur was found in Big Bend National Park, just a few miles from the Rio Grande, and therefore from Mexico in Texas. And it's named Aquilorhinus polymentus. Aquilorhinus comes from aquila, which means eagle in Latin. And it's in a few dinosaur names. There's also like aquilops. Everything that has a beak always has the potential for getting described like an eagle, because eagles also have beaks. <laughs> and then in this case, rhinus means nose. So aquilorhinus means eagle nose, basically. And that's because they think its rostrum, or basically nose, is eagle-like. And then polymentus means shovel chin in Latin. That's an interesting one. Yeah. So it's got an eagle beak, but a shovel chin, which is weird. The illustrations, yeah, it's a really interesting looking dinosaur based on these illustrations. <laughs> yes. So with its nose, they describe it as having broadly arched nasals. In other words, a nose that bulges up from the snout. So if you imagine something like an Amontosaurus has more of a flat snout, you just kind of puff it up a little bit towards the front. That's what you get with this dinosaur. I didn't really get at first that it looked like an eagle skull. So I looked up a bunch of pictures of eagle skulls because eagles have all these feathers on their head. So it doesn't really make their nose or their rostrum or beak or whatever you want to call it stand out that much. But when you look at it as a skull, it really does take up quite a portion of the skull. So if you look at something like a vulture, the keratinized part of the beak is really only at the tip. And then something like a parrot has a much shorter head. But Aquilorhinus really does sort of have the proportions more like an eagle. It's got a similar curvature to its nose as an eagle beak. And then it also kind of has the same proportions in relative terms to the size of its head. So I think it's a pretty fitting name. But of course, the end of the beak is very different than a hadrosaurus <laughs> because eagles have that beak that extends past the lower jaw to a point so that they can kind of peck into things. Whereas on all these hadrosaurs, they just have these big leaf gulping. <laughs> They're just trying to shovel in the food. Yeah. And sometimes they are depicted as a little bit serrated in the keratin, but that's just so that it can grab onto leaves better. It's not puncturing anything, that's for sure. Then as far as the shovel-shaped bill goes, they think it likely ate semi-aquatic vegetation, as they call it, which I had to look up what that was because I don't know what semi-aquatic plants are, but apparently it's things like water cabbage, certain conifers, there are other ferns, there's also horse tails, things like that. So it's not usually in a deep thing of water, it's something that you imagine more in like a marsh that it might be scooping up. <laughs> 
If you want to imagine what this weird shovel-shaped bill looks like, you can kind of imagine the lower jaw of an Edmontosaurus without the keratin. So if you look at most representations of Edmontosaurus, you only see the calcium, the bone part that usually fossilizes. And in that, it does look a lot like a duck because <laughs> it doesn't have like a nice end to its bill. It just looks like a big, flat, weird bill. That's why they're known as the duck-billed dinosaurs. Exactly. But later on, we found out that at the end of Edmontosaurus's skull, it had these big keratinized, almost like front teeth in our mouth that sort of held everything in and held everything together and maybe helped it bite things or otherwise just keep it in its mouth. So it actually does have like a, a full lower jaw that could hold water or food in it. But on this one, they think that that rather than that keratin kind of curving up at the end, it would have pointed straight out. So maybe that's why they were thinking semi-aquatic, because if it's scooping up a bunch of water, you want the water to run back out of your mouth as you get this vegetation in. It's really interesting. Aquilorhinus is not a sorolophene or a lambiosaurine. Usually we talk about hadrosaurs as being in one of those two groups. And we describe Lambiosaurinae as the group with large head crests like Parasaurolophus. And then usually Sorolophinae is basically just all the other dinosaurs in the derived group with members like Edmontosaurus. But in this article, the authors clarify that they think crests began with early hadrosaurids before the group split and diversified so that we should make the distinction that early hadrosaurids and sorolophenes had solid crests, while lambiosaurines later evolved hollow crests. So Aquilorhinus had these solid crests and wasn't in either group yet, so it's more of like a basal one, and it has that basal characteristic of a solid crest, a big bump on its nose, like we see in later sorolophenes. For example, Gryposaurus, which at first glance it looks a lot like, but it actually isn't a sorolophene yet. <laughs> this is kind of an interesting in-between dinosaur. The bones of Aquilorhinus were collected in 1983, and then again in 1999, they went back to the same spot. And I think they said it was all in like a four square meter area, which is less than probably whatever room you're in. So pretty small area that they found all these bones from. And they found a lot of bones from the skull. They found most of the mouth pretty much the full maxilla and then a partial dentary. They found the nasal and a few smaller bones from back in the skull. And then in addition, they also found part of the hyoid, which is the bone that holds the tongue in place, which is really cool. And they said that it was particularly small. So I'm thinking maybe it could have moved its tongue around a little bit more. Ooh, grabbing at those plants. Yeah, it could have been useful for the aquatic or semi-aquatic plants. I don't know. <laughs> They also found some non-head bones, including parts of the scapula, humerus, hips, ribs, vertebrae, leg bones, and a nearly complete left hand. Although other than that left hand, most of those bones are very fragmentary. It looks like it took a lot of work to glue it all back together and figure out where it went. Aquilorhinus is very similar to Laterhinus, which means broad nose <laughs> as opposed to eagle nose. And it was found just across the border in Mexico, Laterhinus was. So they are obviously pretty close in proximity. And in the description of Laterhinus, it was also described as very similar to Griposaurus. It has a pretty similar nose. They just described it as broad rather than eagle-like. But really, they look a lot alike. At first, I was thinking, is this just a case of two different authors wanting to name different things? But Albert Prieto Marquez was the lead author on the Laterhinus description as well. So he named both of the dinosaurs, so he's clearly aware <laughs> that there is this very similar dinosaur. And in their phylogenetic analysis, Aquilorhinus and Laterhinus came out as the only two members of a new group just outside of Sorolophinae and Lambiosaurinae. So maybe we're starting to see another... More diversity in the hadrosaurs? Yeah. I'm also not even sure if they coexisted because of the dating on the sediments that they were in, but they definitely lived within at least 10 million years of each other both in the 70 to 80 million year old time range. I don't think you can see Aquilorhinus anywhere. It's housed at the Texas Memorial Museum in Austin, Texas. And Sabrina and I were just there a couple of years ago. And I don't think we saw it when we were there. There was very little real fossils on display. It was mostly cast replicas and some really awesome invertebrate stuff like these starfish. Oh yeah, that fossils. was cool. Yeah. But I don't know what how they decide to put things on exhibit since this is a new find, maybe. 
Well, it was found back in 1999, the most recent stuff. It was just described now. Oh, I see. Although it could be that they're like, to go along with the publication, we'll put it on display. It's possible. Yeah. They have an Instagram account. They post pretty regularly. So maybe you'll see it pop up there. (laughs) Next, thanks to Trevor, one of our new patrons who shared this one with us. So in Lightning Ridge in Australia, a large group of opalized fossils have been found by two miners. And these were from an herbivorous dinosaur and they're intact which is saying a lot for fossils found in that area. Oh, yeah. Those tend to be very small and fragmented. Yeah, because they find them while mining. So mm-hmm. they tend to break them into little tiny pieces. And then somebody gets a bag of rock and goes, oh, there's a couple of teeth sticking out of this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these fossils are going to go to Adelaide to be analyzed and CT scanned. And then they're going to be studied at the University of New England. And then once they're all reassembled, the dinosaur will go back to Lightning Ridge and be put on display at a new center that's going to open in 2021. So lots of exciting things happening to these fossils. That is. I'm assuming the University of New England is in Australia? (laughs) Yes, in New South Wales. So it's making like a grand tour of Australia. (laughs) Starts in Lightning Ridge, then heads over to Adelaide, and then back up. It's too bad that new center won't be opened until 2021, since we're going to be in Lightning Ridge in 2019. (laughs) (laughs) We can always go back. Yeah, maybe there'll be something early there. We can kind of see where it's going to be. Probably not, but one can hope. (laughs) We'll see some opalized fossils. That's the main thing I want to see. Yes, I want to get inside some of those. There's a mine, I think, in Lightning Ridge that we can go into. Hmm. Should be fun. We have lots of plans for Australia. We'll see if we can fit in everything. (laughs) Yeah. Next, we've got a quick update on the ruling over whether or not dinosaur fossils are considered to be minerals. And this is about the lawsuit over the dueling dinosaurs, which is now back at Montana Supreme Court. So quick recap. In April, Montana passed a law that, quote, fossils are not minerals and that fossils belong to the surface estate, unless it's been explicitly said otherwise. But that doesn't apply to existing disputes, which included the dueling dinos. So the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that fossils were minerals. And then David Polly, who's the former president of SVP, said that that ruling makes looking for fossils complicated because paleontologists would need to figure out surface ownership, where to dig, and mineral ownership, which can be difficult to find and Mm -hmm. often changes hands. So it's kind of a weird situation because you have to know the surface rights holder just to physically be on the surface of the land. Mm -hmm. But then in order to dig... But then in order to know who the thing belongs to, once you find it, it could be a whole other ball game. Right. I see. So then it's really advantageous if they're considered surface rights because it's just one group then. Yes. Well, there's also a tricky thing. He said the ruling could raise questions about the ownership of fossils that are currently in museums. Oh, geez. So a group including SVP, the Field Museum, and the Museum of the Rockies are working with Gary Guzzi, former White House counsel on Environmental Quality and Environmental Protection Agency General Counsel, to convince the, quote, Ninth Circuit to pump the brakes, end quote. (laughs) I had to quote it from the article because pump the brakes was too good. (laughs) Anyway, the case is now at the Montana Supreme Court. It's going to be looked at later this year. So we'll keep you posted as we hear updates. Yeah, seems like it could go either way. I'm thinking if Montana already passed that law, I guess, since it doesn't apply to existing disputes, but yeah, it's complicated. And they've previously ruled that it was part of the mineral estate. It's like, it's messy. Yeah. And now on to our interview with Jen Bauer. So we get to chat today with Dr. Jennifer Bauer, who is a postdoctoral associate at the Florida Museum of Natural History with a focus on the My Fossil Project and the Thompson Institute for Earth Systems. She's also the co-creator, along with Adrian Lamb, of Time Scavengers, a collaborative website curated by scientists that provides the public with a basic understanding of our most important geologic concepts. And she volunteers at the McClung Museum of Natural History and Culture. Well, thanks so much for chatting with us today. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to be here. So kind of what caught our eye is recently on Time Scavengers, you posted about how to become a paleontologist. So can you tell us a little bit about that, that post and that survey? Yeah, definitely. So um, one of the probably most frequent questions you get um, when you introduce yourself as a paleontologist is how do you become a paleontologist? And a couple of my friends over at the Common Descent podcast have been getting this more frequently from some of their kind of frequent viewers. So I decided that it might be a good idea to kind of survey the community because 
not all paleontologists need to have PhDs, but sometimes that's kind of the impression that you get. So I wanted to kind of see how many people I could get to answer a series of questions about their kind of journey or path to becoming a paleontologist. That's great. And so how did you, you, you tweeted about it and you got something like 125 responses? Yeah, it was actually way easier than I thought it would be. Um, (laughs) Surveys are always like hit or miss, right? Because people either click it and they're like, there's way too many questions. I don't have time for this. So I tried to just pick a couple really important questions and then offer a couple of free forum responses. So we didn't get 125 responses for every question, but I think I did a pretty good job at asking the right questions so that the people could kind of click through the Google form really easily. Nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's a great breakdown, too, on time scavengers of who answered what and how they answered. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The idea was to present the data and not make it like a personal experience because we wanted to have it be a collective showing, not just one or two people, but mm-hmm. 125 people. Yeah, that's really great because we've interviewed some paleontologists before. And we asked them, like, how would you get into paleontology? And it's like, well, I grew up on this farm and then I found this fossil when I was seven. And then it's like, <laughs> okay, well, this isn't like a replicable kind of thing <laughs> that's being described. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but like our survey suggests that about 50% of people, like that was their path. That's awesome. Yeah. They, they always wanted to be a paleontologist. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah. So could I quickly ask, when you say paleontologist, do you mm-hmm. have an idea about what that job is? Because I hear a lot of different things even about like what a paleontologist is. Yeah. So when I put the tweet out advertising for people to take the survey, I mentioned that if you were paid for your expertise in paleontology, like somehow your knowledge is your career, then you should take the survey. So we didn't have really too many constraints. Um, And a couple people I know who were paid as undergraduate researchers also took the survey. Gotcha. Okay. That's a good definition. Because <laughs> I've, I've, we've spoken to people who are like, well, I do paleontology and I've been doing it for 40 years, but I don't have a degree in paleontology, so I don't consider myself a paleontologist. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a fine line, but I don't think degrees make the scientist, right? It's all about what you kind of learn along your, your way. Yeah, for sure. Was there anything that really surprised you that came out of this survey? Um, I guess I expected... I asked a couple questions on doing research early in your career, like as a high school student or undergraduate student. And I expected more people to have said no, but it was actually a very small percentage, about 14 and a half percent said that they did not do research Hmm. as an undergraduate. And then I had the follow up question. If you did do research, was it on paleontology? And the majority of them did do that research on paleontology, which I found also surprising. Yeah, that is really surprising. (laughs) <laughs> especially yeah. considering i know it's like a lot of biology and geology you'd think people might be off in some other fields as an undergraduate and then kind of shift into paleontology later mm-hmm. yeah i agree it seems like there was a theme well you pointed this out on the post too that there's no one way to become a paleontologist it's not really a linear path which we've kind of been talking about and so that's i think good to know for people who might be considering this Yeah, I agree. So I found paleontology, I would say later in my career, I was a fourth year undergraduate, I was getting ready to graduate that semester. And I took took intro to paleontology kind of as a fun elective. My undergraduate was in like biological sciences, but my school was very uh, medical school focused. So Mm -hmm. there wasn't like a huge ecology program or things like that. It was mostly like cell based. So I kind of just took it for fun. And then I asked the professor, how I could become a paleontologist. Um, And he offered me a job. And that's kind of how I got started. (laughs) That's really cool. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So a bit an unexpected path for me as well. Definitely. What's been your focus as a paleontologist? I have a large interest in the shellies. So I've worked primarily on brachiopods and echinoderm. So yeah, the dead relatives of sea stars are my current focus. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when I hear about those groups of invertebrates, I always mm-hmm. think like, yeah, those are great because they're really useful for dating sediments. <laughs> Aww. So, sorry. <laughs> they have a lot of really cool uses. 
<laughs> so what else, what about them specifically do you like? Um, well, the group that I work on right now is really spectacular because for Paleozoic echinoderms, so things that are like 545 million years to about 240 million years old, mm-hmm. a lot of those groups don't live for very long. And the group that I study lived for about 200 million years. So that's most of the Paleozoic. Yeah. They lived on about every continent. We know a lot about them, but not enough. So they have about 3 million pieces and only about 20 preserve. <laughs> so oh, <God>. wow. <laughs> it's pretty much just like their body. So there's a lot of really cool questions that you can think about asking. Um, and the echinoderm family tree kind of in the Paleozoic is really not fully understood. So kind of filling in our understanding and thinking about all aspects of morphology. So we have outside of the animal, but can we see inside it? And is there new information that we can get with kind of advanced imaging technology? Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, I think so. (laughs) (laughs) Where in Florida do you find these types of fossils? Because I think of Florida as being like very lush. Yeah, you don't find these fossils in Florida. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yeah, they're mostly in the mid-continent region. Florida is all Cenozoic, so very recent rock. Gotcha. Cool. So you also curate the digital fossil collection on MyFossil. And I think, Garrett, we've talked about MyFossil before when the mobile app first came out, which is exciting. Yeah. But for our listeners who might not be familiar, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, definitely. So MyFossil is kind of like a It's like a social media platform, but specifically for paleontologists. The primary goal was to kind of connect amateur and professional paleontologists to kind of foster collaborations and share ideas and share specimens. I mean, one of the aspects that I'm specifically focusing on with my work is people can upload their personal fossil collection. So everyone has fossils stored in boxes somewhere in your house, but you can upload your images, you can upload the data, and then what we're implementing now is people on the back end will look at your fossils, they'll validate the information. And if the data that you input is really high quality, so maybe you have your GPS coordinates, you know when in time you were, you know what kind of rock you were in, that information can then be sent off to data aggregators. So like mm-hmm. iDigBio and GBIF, which are these kind of big digital spaces where museums and other kind of citizen science programs and their data. So then it will be accessible by pretty much anyone that is interested in whatever organism you're studying. Oh, that's Great. cool. Is yeah. that, are either of those related to that paleo database, I want to say it's called? Oh, the paleobiology database? Yeah, I think so. It's like a big map and then you can put in different time periods. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So the way that the databases get their data is different. So the paleobiology database is sourced through publication. So okay. it's essentially a huge literature dump, whereas <laughs> IDIG Bio is museum collections. Oh, cool. So not it has even more than because it doesn't even have to be published. It could just be like a picture somebody posted with a coordinate. Yeah. Or some. so the stuff that's important is the data, not so much the images. The images are like kind of a supplemental to the data. Okay. So that's like measurements and things like that? Uh, Measurements, location, the geologic period, what kind of rock, that sort of stuff. Nice. And so it's anybody who's interested can use the app and interact with people through the app? Yeah, the app is pretty fun. Um, I've been posting some photos from my recent trip to Chicago. We have a group called Vacation Explorers. So (laughs) if you're like looking to go on a paleontology vacation, you can kind of look through that group and see where people have been, what they saw, and how maybe maybe you want to go see it too. That's great. Kind of brings me back to the survey. There was a part about how there's a lot of informal learning happening, whether that's public lectures or going to museums and fossil collecting and stuff like that. So that just seems like another way, another path to paleontology. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And the app is pretty active too. So if like, somebody is interested in getting a fossil identified, it and you're a little bit nervous to like take it to the museum, uh, the app is a great place to start. We have a group that's called What Is It? So very easy oh, nice. to find. Yeah, and people will chime in. Everybody has their own expertise. Oh, cool. We'll have to start sending people that way because sometimes people ask us like, hey, can you guys tell us what this fossil is? And we're like, no, <laughs> we're not We're not good enough to know that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't be an expert in everything, right? We yeah. all have our interests. Yeah. Very true. <laughs> 
So you also work at the Thompson Institute for Earth Systems. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So we actually recently underwent a name change. So now we are the Thompson Earth Systems Institute. Mm. It's sort of like a subdivision within UF and the Florida Museum. And the purpose of the institute is to translate research done at UF surrounding earth systems. So air, water, life, and land, very simply, and make it more understandable to Floridians. So Florida is in a very kind of strange place when we're thinking about climate change, and it's going to get a lot of the effects pretty immediately. So we want to make sure that the Floridians are informed when they're making decisions, when they see things that maybe seem kind of odd, when nuisance flooding is more common, providing resources and information to the public, pretty much. Cool. So what's your role there? So we only just started the Institute, so we've had a lot of growing pains over the last year kind of year. I think we turn one next month. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, congrats. Yeah, so very young. <laughs> Thank you. So we've been hiring people, but my role is primarily as um, an educator and I do research kind of on scientists in the state so we can kind of connect with experts. Cool. Yeah. This is sort of informal, but one thing I've been noticing, the more paleontologists we, we talk to, it seems like paleontologists tend to be involved in a lot of projects at once. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Yeah, I I think it's because we have a a pretty good mix of earth sciences and biological sciences. So Mm -hmm. we're at like this kind of really cool apex of lots of really interesting things are going on both in the past and right now. Yeah. Is that I know you're you only did your survey once, so you might not want to guess, but (laughs) I I feel like it's a more recent trend for people going more into the biology side of things and then being interested in paleontology. Do you think that's the case or am I totally crazy? Um, I think it's been kind of a mix. Okay. So s- since I started, the more people I've kind of spoken to, they suggest biology as kind of the core starting and then moving into geology for your graduate work. Uh, but a lot of the undergraduates that I come across are still studying geology and wanting to get more into paleontology. So I think it just has to do with underlying interests. But there's so much overlap because it's just studying the biology of dead things. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have any advice for people who might like just be realizing, oh, paleontology is my passion and want to get into it? Um, Yeah, I think that this is kind of touched on in the survey, probably in the same section with, so the question was, what experiences outside of formal education helped you maintain interest in paleontology? So I think similar things can help people get, get in their foot in the door into paleontology. So thinking about volunteering at museums, joining local clubs. Um, My fossil actually has a list of clubs and organizations uh, with like a nice map. So you can search by your location and see what local fossil clubs might be near you. That's, I think, one of the most excellent ways to get into paleontology. I've had a lot of great experiences with club members and they're always very supportive Mm -hmm. and they don't treat you like you don't know things, (laughs) (laughs) which is sometimes hard to find, right? Um, Yeah, especially on the internet. (laughs) Yeah, people can be cruel, but also club members are very nice. People in museums are great. Just kind of putting yourself into the situations where you can learn more. Yeah. Yeah. I think in general, the paleontology community is one of the most accepting of like new thoughts and things like that. We've had a good experience at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. I think a reason for that might be they're really excited to test old ideas with like new technology and things like that, because technology is always changing. And there are some ideas that have been around in paleontology for a really long time. But with new statistics, new simulations, there's lots of old things that can now be actually quantitatively addressed. Yeah, that's very true. And it's it seems like a humbling <laughs> profession, because no matter how big of a star or like how smart a paleontologist is, they're always working with such limited information that you can't extrapolate very far and everybody's made mistakes and, you know, bad guesses that at the time seemed reasonable, but then as things go along, no longer the case. Yeah, exactly. I had an undergraduate um, when I was at Tennessee and she was really concerned about the data she was analyzing and if her interpretations were correct. And I looked at her and I was like, no one's ever done this before. (laughs) I was like, it's okay. I was like, it's an interpretation and you're using what you have and you're making educated statements about the data. And that's what's important. Yep. Yeah. 
And even if it's always interesting too, when you see a study and like the primary purpose that they're focusing on might end up not being the case later, or at least the assumptions that they make on it, but it could be useful as a building block to something else. Like, oh, but we used their phylogenetic tree that they came up with when they were trying to study this other thing because that worked well for us. Love science. Yeah, I've definitely done that too. Like I didn't like how somebody did a certain thing, but the underlying aspects of their data was really useful. So it's a good starting point. There's no point in like inventing the wheel again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true. I like this one quote that you put up there is somebody said, reach for the stars and take math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish I had taken more math and statistics classes. They really come in handy and trying to teach yourself is is fine. There's a lot of resources online, but it's easier if someone else is teaching you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> so when did you and Adrian start Time Scavengers? Uh, let's see. I think... In the fall of 2016, she wanted to start a website on climate change and evolution uh, because they're controversial topics in popular media. They cause a lot of debate. Um, and we both study these topics just in the past. Mm -hmm. She's a paleo-oceanographer, paleoclimatologist by training, and I'm an evolutionary paleobiologist. So it seemed like a pretty good idea. Um, and everybody loves fossils. So... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kind of diving into these complex topics through fossils is a little bit less scary than going in it from a genetics or chemistry standpoint. Sure. Yeah. And it's probably a little more accessible, too, because one of the problems with explaining climate change is explaining statistics and things like that. But if you can show a story of climate change, which we can't do in modern times, but you can do <laughs> with the fossil record, that's a, a good way to show people what's going to happen, <laughs> what could happen. Yeah, I agree. And so Time Scavengers, it's grown now too, right? There's a lot of people involved. Um, yeah, we have about 10 collaborators um, that range from uh, faculty to avocational scientists. Mm -hmm. So a pretty wide range. Um, and our collaborators all have different backgrounds, different identities that kind of help contribute to the diversity that Time Scavengers is trying to represent and showcase. Very cool. So for our listeners, where is the best place if they wanted to find out more about you and your work? Probably heading to Time Scavengers. Um, we have a biography page if you go to the About Us at the top. Um, and it has a little bit about how Adrian and I met and then kind of backgrounds of all of us and kind of what we do. Um, and I think my website's linked on there. So they'll have access to, to more information specifically on me. Great. Awesome. And then, of course, if they want to get more into fossils, sounds like they need to download my fossil app. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I recommend it. It's it's pretty fun to see what people find. And we have a, an international audience now. So there's people from all over the world kind of chiming in. Ah, that's great. Good. Then you can get way more pictures. Yeah, definitely. And it's field season now. So hopefully we start getting some cool fossil finds from the field. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Garrett's nodding vigorously. Like <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan of going out in the middle of the desert looking at the ground, but I'm glad other people do it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. We've been on one dig. I I was terrible at being able to identify what was a fossil versus yeah. a regular rock. <laughs> and I had to reapply sunscreen about every hour. <laughs> oh, yeah. You really have to dress appropriately when you go out west. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for chatting with us today. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Thanks again, Jen. It's really cool to hear about all the different ways people can become paleontologists and how it doesn't really matter when you start or how you start, as long as you're passionate. Before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we want to bring up really quickly again what we discussed in the beginning of the show, which is that we'll be launching our latest dinosaur book, 50 Dinosaur Tales, in October. And to celebrate, all of our Tyrannosaurus patrons will get a special signed copy of the book. So if you're a Tyrannosaurus patron, please make sure to update your mailing address so that we can send you the book. And if you're not yet a Tyrannosaurus patron, but you would like a special signed copy, join the Tyrannosaurus level by August 21st. That's at patreon.com slash inodino. We're also looking for people to help us launch this book and become part of our launch team. So if you want to help us 
with reading the book ahead of time and leaving reviews and promoting the book in other ways, please let us know by filling out our Google form. And the link for that is bit.ly slash dinosaur book team. All lowercase. Yes. And that form will be open until August 5th, and then we'll start mailing out information to our new book launch team. Yeah, we're pretty excited about it. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Tool Geongosaurus, which was a request from Dinosaur 4602, so thanks. Tool Geongosaurus was a stegosaur that lived in the late Jurassic in what is now the Sichuan province in China, in the upper Shashimiao Formation. It was about 23 feet, or 7 meters long, and about 2.8 tons, although Gregory Paul estimated that it weighed 2.8 tons for a specimen that was about 21 feet, or 6.5 meters long. It's still big. Yes. Either way. Maybe even a little bigger. As <laughs> most dinosaurs are. Yep. <laughs> Tuojiangosaurus was described in 1977 by Dong Jiming and others, but the description was mostly of traits that other stegosaurs had. Peter Galton wrote an autopomorphy in 1990 and said that it had pairs of spines at the base of the tail, the thagomizer. It had also bony skirts that ran from the front to the sides. Yeah, you've probably seen pictures or toys of this dinosaur. It looks a lot like a stegosaurus, except it's got more spikes, kind of transitions from plates to spikes as you get farther back. Mm-hmm. A spikier, sharper stegosaurus. <laughs> or a bony skirt, if you're Peter Galton. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So it had two spikes that pointed out from the end of the tail. That's the thagomizer. Though Dong thought there may have been four spikes. Gregory Paul described them as a pin cushion array with two vertical pairs of spikes and another pair of spikes that pointed behind. It also had rows of plates on the spine and the tallest ones were around the hip area. The plates near the neck and the front of the body were rounded and the plates near the back were more pointy and triangular. And the plates were shaped in a way that looked like modified spikes like what Garrett was saying. But in toys, they usually just are spikes. Yes. <laughs> Dong estimated that there were 17 pairs of plates and spikes. It's a lot. Tolji Angosaurus had a narrow, low head and a bulky body, and it had short limbs, especially the forelimbs. It ate ground vegetation, and it probably kept its head close to the ground. It had teeth that were better for soft vegetation. The fossils were first found in 1974 during construction of a dam in Zigong, Sichuan. The type species is Tolgiangosaurus multispinus, and that genus name means Toll River Lizard, and the species name means many spines. Scientists initially found two specimens, but more specimens have since been referred to Tolgiangosaurus, including juveniles. The holotype is mostly complete, but it's missing parts of the skull, lower jaws, tail, and limbs. When it was described, it was, however, the most complete stegosaur skeleton found in Asia at the time. And... You're probably not surprised to hear, Tolgiangosaurus is a sister taxa to Stegosaurus. You can see Tolgiangosaurus amount of it at the Municipal Museum of Chongqing in China, and another amount of it at the Beijing Museum of Natural History. It's fighting a young Tronosaurus. You can also see a cast of Tolgiangosaurus at the Natural History Museum in London, which we did. Yeah, I don't remember that one specifically. I remember Sophie. Oh yeah, Sophie. That one gets a much more prominent display. <laughs> and our fun fact of the day is that there is a formation of Cretaceous rock larger than Montana in Central Africa that is completely unexplored. Wow. Yeah. Think of the dinosaurs. I know, I do. So <laughs> it's primarily in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the DRC is about a third the size of the continental U.S. When you look at a map of Africa you don't realize just how massive it is because it gets a little distorted by where it is on the globe, kind of like how Antarctica ends up looking huge and Greenland looks huge. Africa actually kind of looks smaller than it is compared to the US, but it's a massive area. And so far there's only one bone on the paleobio database and that's an indeterminate sauropod bone. That's been found in the DRC or? Yeah, Okay. in this whole area, basically. Wow. Now, the paleobio database might not have every fossil that's been found, but it's usually a pretty good indication of how much research is going on in an area because it's all the recent publications at the very least. And there is a ton of Cretaceous rock there, but unfortunately, it's under, well, fortunately and unfortunately, <laughs> it's under a lot of fertile land. So it's not quite as easy to fossil hunt there because there's other useful things to do with the land other than walk around looking for dinosaur bones. But Having a good group of local paleontologists would be awesome because when you go to, say, like excavate a foundation for a new building or if you're digging for 
say, putting in irrigation or just walking around farming land or tilling or who knows what, you can find these bones. As we see all the time in China, farmers discover bones on their land too. Say you're digging for a new lake or reservoir, that happens. I looked through some of the major universities' areas of focus in the DRC and I couldn't find paleontology anywhere. There might be a smaller museum that has it that I didn't find, but I really can't find much of a presence. I also couldn't find any dinosaur museums or paleontology museums in the country. And the country has over 80 million people, so I think it's kind of a shame. And I think there are lots of kids in the DRC who would love a dinosaur museum. So hopefully the paleontology program starts to develop in the DRC the way we're seeing it starting in places like Egypt with Mansoura University, and then they've made some awesome discoveries since then. It'd be great if this spread around to other countries in Africa. Definitely. And as a side note, the way that I discovered this formation was a website called One Geology, which lets you look all over the world at different rock ages. So I was looking around to see if there were any Cretaceous or Jurassic or maybe even Triassic formations where we don't have a lot of dinosaur discoveries by comparing it to the Paleobio database. And this is the most obvious one to me, but I'm sure there are other ones. And if you're interested in what kind of rock is around your house, it's also a cool place to check out. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And one last reminder, if you're a Tyrannosaurus patron, you'll get a special signed copy of our upcoming book, 50 Dinosaur Tales. And if you want to be part of our awesome new launch team, then please sign up by August 5th at bit.ly slash dinosaur book team. Thanks again. And until next time. Good day.